more good evening. We will be talking about uh, self-organizing networks uh, today. Briefly, my introduction, uh, I graduated from Virginia Tech with a PhD in electrical engineering. I have worked for Nortel and Huawei, where I designed uh, radio resource management algorithms for s 95 x EVDO, and UMTS networks for almost uh, seven years. I have been teaching uh, for our solutions. Uh, various technologies, uh, LTE, YMX, uh, UMTS, HSPA, HSPA Plus, and 1X video. Uh, welcome to the session. And before we get into the details of self-organizing networks, uh, if you could please give me quick feedback on a couple of items here. Uh, please uh, participate in all the polls. Uh, that will help us uh, customize this session a little better. And of course, uh, we have Q&A box in live meeting. So feel free to send questions anytime. I would offer you a couple of opportunities to use the audio bridge as well. So if you want to use the audio bridge, feel free to do so. Star 7 unmute, star 6 mute. So for an audio bridge question, Again, star 7, unmute, and star 6, mute. Ten seconds remaining. Okay. Uh, about 40% uh, system test integration, about 30% customer support, um, systems engineering, okay, very good. Now, the kind of details you are looking for today, 30 seconds for this question. Okay, about 75% uh, uh, few details and 25% uh, lots of details. Okay. And again, uh, as I have said uh, in the past, if you want something more than what we discuss, please ask questions. That will make sure that we are customizing this session for you. When you ask a question, you help yourself your colleagues and me. So please ask questions. Okay, so basically we are at session number eight, uh, and the last session would be on LT advance. So today the focus is on self-organizing networks. Okay, as far as the uh, sun is concerned, these are the topics that are within the scope today. Why self-organizing network? What are the benefits ASAN can provide? Uh, self-organizing network ASAN has a different state. So we have pre-operational state and the operational state. And depending on that state, we have different functions that ASAN can perform. So we will talk about those. A given SON function, for example, creating a neighbor list automatically, a given SON function like that could be implemented in a centralized fashion, a distributed fashion, or in hybrid fashion. So we will talk about the architectures, centralized, distributed, and hybrid. And we would spend quite a bit of time 
discussing various use cases, basically how we apply this concept to take care of a variety of functions. I already mentioned one example, creating a neighbor list automatically. There are several things uh, where a son can help us. We will talk in detail about those. First, let me motivate you why son should be given enough respect. So here is the basic idea. We have in LTE potentially a large number of e node pieces. We may even have lot of uh, in-building LTE cells called home e-node base. We have typical macrocellular network, large cells, some suburban, some rural environment. Then we have some uh, micro cells, perhaps uh, in the cities and some suburban areas. Then we may have pico cells right, covering some buildings and even femto cells where we have home e node base. Now it's possible that LTE gets a lot of femto cell type business. So in that case, we will have many, many home e node bases, many, many LTG cells and e node bases. So we want to manage such large number of e node bases in a variety of deployment environments shown here. So if you have some way of configuring those e node bases automatically, taking care of several aspects of e node B operations, such as creating a neighbor list automatically. Then we would uh, spend, uh, we, we will not spend a lot of uh, resources, financial or otherwise, on managing the e node B. So that is a very important uh, motivating factor. So if we have some automated way of managing e node Bs, that would be highly appreciated, especially considering a huge number of e node bases. Of course, uh, when you have LTE arriving on the scene, legacy technologies are not going away anytime soon. So if you recall, MS was active right, for a very, very long time, the first generation cellular system, analog system, it survived couple of decades. So existing 2G, 3G technologies, they are not going away anytime soon. So it means we have to have interworking between LTE and legacy technologies. So 2G, 2.5G, GSM, GPRS, Edge, 3G technologies, 1X, EVDO, UPS, HSP, HSP, plus, and so on. They are not going away anytime soon, so we have to have interworking between LT and those technologies. So in uh, some of the sessions, we talked about those technologies uh, from the interworking perspective. Now, if uh, we have some automatic way of working with other technologies, for example, choosing some inter-red handover thresholds, cell reselection thresholds, then that would uh, simplify our work quite a bit. A at least uh, maybe we can uh, eliminate some human errors, so things like that. So we want to get some help in that interworking area as well. So one can be quite uh, useful. And finally, we have an RF engineer here. The engineer here has to work with 
lot of parameters, especially when we have to worry about uh, this. Home e node bees, we have to have seamless interworking with legacy technologies. So if you consider that, then there are many, many parameters that we have to manage. We have to find default values, then we have to optimize those dynamically perhaps. So configuring the network parameters, optimizing those to get the maximum value out of LTE, we need some help. So we can help our RF engineers by simplifying some of the tasks, by automating some of the tasks. So those are some of the motivating factors uh, for deploying on type uh, mechanism. Let's say we deploy SON in the network. Here are some of the benefits we can expect from SON. First of all, since we have this huge number of e node bees, we have now a flexible and automated way of managing those e node bees. So we can, for example, uh, allocate an IP address automatically to the e node bees, and then they will establish connectivity with MMEs. So let's say e node B and MME and then E node B and neighboring E node B, that is X2 connectivity. This is S1 MME interface. Then it would connect to O and M system, operational administration maintenance system. So we can have automatic connectivity with various networks and network elements. That is very, very important. Otherwise, you have to manually configure the E node B with all those things. So if we have SON, then a lot of things would be done automatically. So the reduction in manual involvement would mean that we eliminate some human errors and it will reduce the amount of time we have to spend so we can focus our energy and resources on m more more complex and more uh, important uh, tasks. It will reduce the ongoing expenses, operational operating expenditure, um, because we should be able to use SON to carry out some tasks automatically so that we do not need to spend human resources on those. So that will help us uh, save some money as well. Saving money very, very important in tough economic times, so we would appreciate that very well. Again, in terms of interworking with existing legacy technologies, huge number of parameters we have. So if we can automate uh, some of those, for example, initial default values, and perhaps by observing some uh, real world statistics that, okay, there is a lot of uh, cell reselection to a specific technology, then we can modify those cell reselection thresholds, uh, things like that we can do. Again, minimize the manual efforts and then uh, that should help uh, us get a better performance relatively quickly. Configuring the parameters automatically and changing the parameters based on observation of some measurements, some key performance indicators and so on, uh, we should be able to uh, get uh, maximum bits for given dollar amount. So cost per bit, we should be able to reduce 
when we have son taking care of lot of operation uh, uh, automatically. So it should maximize our capacity, number of users. It should optimize the performance. Uh, for a packet data system, what is the most important performance metric? Maybe you can give me a couple of examples. Because LT is uh, essentially a packet data system. So for a packet data system, so how would you quantify performance? You can give me the answer through Q&A box. How do we quantify performance of a packet data system? Can you give me one or two KPIs? Okay, very good. We got uh, at least uh, one answer. Okay, uh, throughput is one of the most important performance matrix KPIs for a packet data system. So that is correct. A delay is another important uh, performance metric, especially for real-time services such as voice over IP, interactive gaming. So that's very important. So latency very important. Uh, time to access the system another important KPI. So that is the reason that we are aiming for. Uh, very, very you know, short delay from idle to connected mode type transition. So access time is also very, very important. So we are idle, no radio connection, and now getting a radio connection to be able to do data transfer. That kind of access delay, the transition delay, uh, should be quite uh, short. So 100 milliseconds is the target. So that that's uh, one of the important uh, aspects. Now, I got a couple of questions and some answers. So, uh, do I have numbers uh, for cost per bid reduction with SON? Uh, not uh, really. Uh, this is sort of uh, a qualitative statement, not a quantitative one. So qualitatively, if uh, we have to do the manual configuration, right, then it would take a lot of time because we have so many e node bees, um, especially with the home e node bees, right? That's a very, very uh, uh, time-consuming task. So if you have some automatic software configuration capability, then that should significantly cut down the manual involvement. So that is just a qualitative statement. I do not have any actual numbers. Yeah, but when you are trying to sell this feature to operators, yeah, it's a good idea to have some kind of uh, quality, quantitative numbers cost per bit reduction. But personally, I do not have such a number. Throughput per user, yeah, user throughput also important KPI. That's a good point. Error rate and delay are also mentioned. Uh, minimum, average, maximum throughput are also mentioned in your responses. Very good. Okay, thank you for your uh, answers. Availability of the network is another answer we got. So that is also a good point. Okay. So these are some benefits that we can get out of uh, self-organizing network. Okay, now before we um, get into the details of SON, let me just uh, give you a quick uh, view of how SON has come into existence. Okay, so basically, as you know, LTE 
was defined in release 8 of UMTS. And then uh, release 9 we have some minor enhancements uh, primary related to services, for example, support for emergency calls. And then release 10, we will talk uh, about that in the very last session of the series, LT Advanced. The system that will formally meet the IMT Advanced uh, requirements for 4G. So we have basically those uh, releases of uh, LT. Now, we have self-organizing network also defined in release 8. So SON is not something new. It has been there for a long time. So along with LTE, we started defining self-organizing network. So even though we had defined the concepts of SON in release 8, okay, then we have started adding features and so on, okay, so that will keep on going. So release 8 started defining SON, and then you will see more and more SON functions as time passes by. So uh, additional features are being introduced in various releases. So we would talk about uh, various fun functions that have been available to the date in different releases, okay? Now when we define SON, we had certain things in our mind. What a SON could potentially do? Potentially. So we said, okay, let's think about a grand vision first. So let's cover as many things as possible. So from that perspective, we had three different kinds of mechanisms within SON. We have so-called self-configuration, self-optimization, and self-healing. So when we started uh, working on SON, our vision was that eventually we would have all these three kinds of mechanisms that SON can provide. So self-organizing network covers those three aspects, so self-configuration, optimizing, and self-healing. Now, there are two states for a son, so-called pre-operational state and operational state. What is a pre-operational state? Pre-operational state means up to whatever we do, we can do various things up to the point when RF transmitter is switched on. Let's say we have E node B. So until you turn on the RF transmitter, whatever happens is 
part of so called pre operational state because the NOB has not started sending out signals over the air. So until the NOB starts transmitting signals over the air, whatever we do that is considered as part of pre operational state. And after the E node B has started sending out the RF signals over the air, whatever happens beyond that point is considered to be happening in the operational state of sound. That's the difference, the pre-operational state and the operational state. Pre-operational, before the RF transmitter is turned on, operational state after the RF transmitter is turned on. So in the pre-operational state, we have so-called self-configuration. So self-configuration would involve many, many things. I will give you just one or two examples. We will go into the details. So basically, uh, we can give IP address to the E node B. Uh, we can establish connectivity with the various uh, elements, neighboring E node B. O and M system, things like that. We can get uh, initial uh, neighbor list. Self optimizing means that now the E node B has started sending out RF signals over there and it has started communicating with the UEs. And based on the UE measurements, we can tune some parameters. For example, we can optimize neighbor list. We can change uh, cell reselection, handover threshold. Those are examples of the things we can do in the self-optimization mechanism. And finally, we have self-healing mechanism. So self-healing means that we detect problems, hardware problems, software problems, and perhaps solve those problems. There's a simple example. Let's say we had version 1.0 for our software, and then we upgrade that to version 2.0. Uh, now, ideally, it is supposed to enhance, because we are going from an older version to a newer version. But maybe there is some software bug, and now things started breaking. So then we can say, oh, there are problems. Let's go back to the original version for now until we fix the problem. So we can then automatically go back to the previous version of the software, e node software, or whatever it may be. So that is one example. So in the song version, we have three different aspects, self-configuration, optimization, and self-healing. So those are the three aspects of the vision. So far, our focus has been on two aspects, okay? self-configuration and optimization. I have looked at the song features functions up to release 10. Release 10, as you know, is work in progress. So whatever has been done so far, I have looked at that. So all the way release 8 to release 10, I have seen the efforts focused on those two aspects, self-configuration and optimization. So no self-healing uh, 
specifics yet. We just know the concept, but uh, there are no actual mechanisms that I am aware of so far. Maybe a little later you may see some mechanisms coming up as part of self-healing. But the standard here is uh, focused on two aspects right now self-configuration and self-optimization. Okay. So you will see in the standard that uh, we have done a lot of uh, work in those two areas, self-configuration and self-optimization. There are some, there is a question, uh, how are neighbors discovered in pre-operational state if uh, the E node B is not on the air yet? Okay, so what we are doing is the following. We have some new E node B. There is some new E node B coming up. Now, in that neighborhood, there are already some pre-existing E node Bs because gradually we are expanding the footprint so maybe there are already few e node bees in that neighborhood and MME, o and m system, uh, some kind of central on entity, they know about those. Okay, so we can provide such initial neighbor list to the newly coming up e node B. That, that is the idea. So there are other e node bees that have already started transmitting over the air. They are already working. So for a new e node B that is just powering up, uh, for such a new emerging e node B, we can provide uh, an existing neighbor list, some kind of initial default neighbor list. So hopefully that is clear. But don't worry, uh, we will have a lot of details coming up for different types of uh, functions or so-called use cases that we can uh, apply uh, on for. Okay, so let's uh, talk about uh, the basics of uh, configuration, optimization, and healing. But uh, as I said uh, right now, we have seen the standard pending efforts on self-configuration and self-optimization. So this song, sometimes you will see the expansion self-organizing network. Sometimes you will see expansion self-optimizing network. Uh, personally, I prefer self-organizing network because self-organization will cover all the three aspects, configuration, optimization, and healing. So that's a better uh, expansion, self-organizing network. Only one aspect is optimization, but we have two other aspects as well. There is some... Uh, question on limiting. Oh, why, why do we worry about uh, self-configuration with LT? Uh, why we didn't uh, do that for UMCS? Uh, do we have a specific uh, need for LT? Good question, good question. So there are a couple of uh, things here uh, at play. Uh, one is we expect and we hope that home e node base, femtocells, would really drive the growth of the LTE market. So far we have been uh, using, let's say, wireless LAN at our home, right? So we connect to DSL, for example, cable modem or whatever. So the idea is that uh, instead of uh, some wire network cable or whatever, we will use uh, directly a cellular network such as LTE. So we are basically getting rid of DSL cable modems uh, and wireless LAN that is connecting to, let's say, uh, our DSL modem, something like that. So we want to get rid of all those and have just a pure LT network. So when the user is uh, at home, then we will use uh, LTE home e -node B, our own dedicated home e -node B that is using LTE technology. And we move outside our home, then uh, we start using the traditional macrocellular and microcellular e node base. So now, uh, traditional cellular operators, AT&T, Verizon, etc., 
they can start getting new business. So today, for example, uh, I pay the regular phone company uh, for local calls, and I have to pay uh, AT and T, uh, Yahoo. So basically, Yahoo was the original company. So I pay my uh, internet access bill to them, uh, and then I have cell phone bill another. So I have all these different uh, parts of my overall communications bill. Now I can have a single unified bill, so AT&T can give me home e would be LTE base station, and then AT&T would give me internet access, AT&T would give me traditional macrocellular access. So now I get a single bill, uh, sort of bundling of various bills together, bundling of services, <coughs> so hopefully that will reduce the cost a little bit for me and AT&T would get uh, more business. So that is the idea. That now, we would have so many applications of uh, LTE, uh, including home in old base, that we would need to manage such a uh, huge number of in old base. Traditionally, we have macrocellular diplomas, macrocellular. We have, let's say, tens of thousands of uh, base stations uh, in the nation, but now, we would significantly increase that because now we have uh, millions of homes now. So the idea is that how do you manage such huge number of e notebooks? And some of them are, as I said, just home e notebooks. And not only that, maybe there are some machine to machine interaction. Uh, so in that case, also we may have some enterprise e notebooks in some Pico cells, for example. Uh, that is automatically uh, taking some measurements from various machines, let's say uh, your gas utilization, uh, electricity utilization, water utilization, maybe you can connect all those uh, to some uh, uh, e-node B in some area, and that will also help you uh, automate uh, those kinds of aspects. So basically, um, just imagination is really your only limitation. You can have some imaginative uh, applications, brand new applications. And in that case, you will again see significant increase in the number of inner base. So the idea with SON is that you can automate configuration of all those inner base, uh, home inner base in particular, uh, that will significantly reduce the operator's involvement uh, in terms of actual manual effort. So even though we could have used uh, this configuration so on with uh, UMTS as well, but now it is becoming even more important because we hope and we expect that maybe with LT there will be significant increase in the number of nodes. That is one of the motivating factors. But if you were to have so on with the UMTS, that would also have helped us. But right now especially we expect uh, a lot of increase in the number of nodes. There is uh, some uh, question, logistic question. Do we cover uh, dynamic frequency planning, uh, et cetera, self-healing? Uh, uh, self-healing um, standard is not uh, doing much in case of self-healing, but uh, toward the end, we do have some uh, energy-saving mechanism, and as part of that, there is some something called sleeping cell or something like that. So we would cover part of that, um, but self-healing does not get much attention in the standard uh, right now. So the reason that you see the course is focusing more on configuration and even more on optimization is because the standard is focusing on that. So we have tried to get as much material as possible for some based on what is really concrete in the standard. It's something that is actually being worked on. We have support in terms of measurements, uh, etc. That's why you will see our optimization discussed more in the course. Okay. So that's uh, the overall scope of um, SON. Now let's spend a few um, minutes on just uh, the high-level view of those three aspects, self-configuration, self-optimization, self-healing. 
and then we will go into the details. Okay. So basically, self-consideration. That is happening in the pretty much pre-operational stage. So the RF transmitter of the E node B is not turned on yet, and uh, we power up the E node B. So now, the E node B would need to do a couple of uh, main tasks. It would have to basically run some software to do the basic setup. For example, it has to get its own uh, IP address. Uh, it has to detect the uh, ONM system. It has to uh, get uh, authenticated. So it has to talk to uh, other system, ONM, etc., to authenticate uh, ONM and to get itself authenticated. Uh, it can associate with some uh, access gateway. Um, now, access gateway basically uh, is something that we can use to go uh, and connect to other network elements. So, so think of that like some kind of default router. And standard doesn't explain that a whole lot, but uh, the idea is that mm, we have some kind of default router. So if you want to mm, go to uh, any other node MME or SZW or another e -Node or whatever, then you need some uh, initial default router and that will help us connect to the outside uh, uh, network, the outside e node B. There is some kind of access gateway, so get associated with that uh, access gateway. But download uh, the software that will help you uh, with some initial parameter settings. And then second aspect is radio configuration. So here we would get some default uh, neighbor list. So based on the knowledge of uh, pre-existing e bees in a given neighborhood, we can uh, get initial uh, neighbor list. So for example, let's say we have some new e -node B here, and there are already some uh, the e node B is in that uh, neighborhood, so we can uh, get information about those as part of the initial configuration. Also, it's possible that we will have initial cell reselection and handover thresholds also available at that time. Yeah, but these are some initial settings. Uh, later on, uh, we will optimize those, but these are some initial values. So even before we turn on the E node B transmitter, we need to have all these basic uh, topics taken care of, because then only uh, we can have, let's say, connectivity with the neighboring E node B, then we can have handover with that E node B, etc. So, uh, we must have such uh, initial uh, configuration. So in this case, we, we do not have some human being entering the neighbor list, right, for that uh, specific E node B. This E node B is uh, talking to some uh, entity, uh, some SON entity, and I will give you some examples later. ONM system is one possible example. So E node B is talking to some external uh, entity to get all this uh, configuration. The idea behind self-configuration is that we would be significantly reducing the human involvement. So that will uh, save us a lot of uh, time and effort. Uh, also, uh, it will reduce the cost um, we can roll out the network faster because we will save a lot of time uh, and hopefully uh, we will be able to minimize the failures 
which are due to human error. Oh, Sam, uh, there is a question on the interpretation of self. So in self-configuration, is the enode configuring itself or some engineer is configuring enode? See, self-configuration means that we do not have any human being putting in the values of various parameters. There is enode B software. So when you power up the enode B, that software gets executed and that software would automatically uh, talk to OEM system, MME, etc. to get various parameters automatically. So there are some parameters not configured by some human being in the E node B, but those parameters are obtained by automatic execution of some software, and that software is exchanging messages with non e -node b entities, MME or mother son entity or neighboring e -node b etc., to get some parameters. So that is the meaning of self-configuration. Self-configuration means that we have some software that is getting all the information. An, an engineer is not manually provisioning or configuring the e -node b with some parameters. There is no human involvement here. The power up process of the enode B uh, results in execution of some software, and that software is doing all this automatically. For example, that software automatically gets an IP address. That software automatically authenticates MME, MME authenticates the enode B, and so on. So enode B is doing this on its own because there is some software. So someone has already designed that software. So if, uh, let's say, you are that uh, son vendor, then, uh, let's say, Verizon and at and they have bought a feature from Alcatel Lucent, and as part of that feature, you are doing all this automatically. So uh, Alcatel Lucent would have to design this kind of software. Okay. Now, that was self-configuration. Uh, basic concept. So here we are showing you some high-level steps. So basically what is happening here is that uh, uh, E node B, okay, we are powering up. So it will have to first figure out its own IP address. Now standard does not tell you how the E node B gets its own IP address. So uh, that is some kind of prerequisite that E node B has to have some IP address so that it can talk to others. So it will get initial IP address on its own, maybe IPv4 or IPv6. Uh, the trend is toward IPv6, so maybe it will get uh, IPv6. Uh, perhaps a stateless auto configuration can be used here. So assume that we have some IP address uh, obtained by the new e -node B. So there are some other e -node Bs in the neighborhood, but this is a new e -node B that is powering up. So then it will uh, contact uh, some default uh, access gateway. Again, the standard doesn't uh, give you too many details, but apparently um, the e -node B has to have some kind of default router. Uh, so it knows that, okay, if I want to get anywhere else, right, some maybe uh, some uh, ONM system or whatever, then initially I have to talk to the image access gateway. So it uh, gets an associatory access gateway. So now access gateway learns about the existence of enode B, and now uh, we can start talking to the outside world. So we can get uh, latest uh, software from some OEM system. Uh, we can get some initial data for configuration. Uh, for example, uh, we may have uh, some information on uh, the maximum power of the e node B uh, that I am taking care of, let's say, 10 megahertz bandwidth, um, things like that. Uh, how many users can I support? So things like that are uh, 
uh, obtained uh, by the E-Node-V automatically from some ONDM system. Uh, of course, uh, before we download all that, we have to make sure that uh, we are talking to a valid ONDM system. So ONDM system uh, authenticates E-Node-V, E-Node-V authenticates the ONDM system. So that is also one of the prerequisites before we can do all these automatic configuration. And once we have downloaded the data, then on an ongoing basis, uh, we would be able to do a normal ONDM function. So maybe we can register for some kind of alarm, um, some links uh, uh, get uh, interrupted. Maybe we lose some uh, connectivity with other e bees or whatever then we can send an alarm to the ONDEM system. So that kind of uh, ONDEM type configuration can be done. Um, maybe we have to report some number of users, how much throughput we are able to support. So all that kind of uh, configuration is also possible as part of uh, step number seven. So as you can see here, after we have powered up the e -Node B, uh, it has automatically got connected to access gateway, some neighboring E node Bs, uh, and uh, we have got connected with ONDM system. Now, how do we know which E node Bs are in our neighborhood? So we can get that as part of the configuration data from the ONDM system. That, by the way, uh, you are in uh, this specific geographic area. So here are the other e node bees that are directly in the neighborhood. Uh, we can even get information on the MMEs that uh, e node bee can uh, connect to. So maybe there are multiple operators. Uh, if you are doing the network sharing, then we will get information about all those MMEs. Or maybe for a given operator, let's say at and or Verizon, there are multiple MMEs for the purpose of redundancy and load balancing. So again, ONDM system, as part of the configuration data, can provide us that information. And now we can contact uh, that MME uh, by setting up S1 MME interface with that. So a lot of things here are happening uh, automatically now as part of the SWAN feature, which is self-configuration. Okay, we have got several uh, questions. Okay, the scope of uh, some is E node B and not A. Yes, yes, that is the main idea. That we want to help the E U tran, the E node B, right? More specific. That that's the idea. That some scope is uh, primarily the radio network. The E node B is the main element we are targeting. That is correct. So SON doesn't tell you, for example, uh, how uh, serving gateway and PGW should uh, get configured. Uh, we, we do not have that kind of uh, information as part of uh, SON function. So that is correct. Uh, scope is scope of SON is basically the EU SON E node B. In ALU, you have some uh, WPS system which configures uh, the E node B with uh, neighbor it and that is done manually. Okay, I see. So that is one uh, just uh, example, right? That right now we are uh, configuring E node B with neighbor it, uh, which is sort of uh, manual configuration. So now we are hoping that a SON function would uh, avoid such manual configuration of neighbor list. That is the benefit of SON. That now we do not need to do that manually. But of course, uh, until on really becomes uh, deployed, widespread, and becomes reliable, we have to do this manually. So currently, in practice, yes, uh, we would be uh, doing this manually, but SON in future, hopefully, will uh, help us do those things uh, automatically. Okay, thanks for your uh, comment. Is SON considered ONDEM or is it uh, software released in the production equipment? 
Yeah, so sun is um, basically uh, some kind of uh, software. In that software, depending on the architecture, centralized, uh, distributed, or hybrid, uh, some of the software may be just in the ONM system alone, maybe for some sun function. The whole software, the whole sound feature is in the ENOB. So it depends on the architecture. So it could be just a part of the ONM that is one possible implementation. But I would uh, suspect that some features would be just uh, distributed and some would be uh, sort of hybrid. Part may be in the ONM system, part may be in the ENOB. Okay. So SON is basically some software. Uh, part of which may be in the inner B, part of which may be in the ONM system. That would be the most common uh, configuration in practice. Looks like we have some additional questions. Let's uh, take care of those. Does SON work with uh, intervendor? Uh, yes, yes. So this is supposed to be uh, vendor independent. That is one of the motivating factors. That maybe, uh, for, forget about uh, radio from one vendor, code from another vendor. The hope is even uh, Alcatel Lucent in Orbi can talk to uh, Ericsson in Orbi. And uh, Ericsson has their own uh, sound feature. You guys have your sound feature and you guys can talk between uh, yourselves. So you, we have communication between ALU ENODV and Ericsson ENODV and it would work. It is supposed to work because uh, we have X2 interface between two ENODVs and that is a standardized interface. So some SON functions can be implemented through cooperation even across the ENODV vendors. So yes, uh, it would be uh, covering uh, multiple vendors. Now, there is one additional comment that someone has heard that SON will cover EPC in future releases. Uh, so for Alcatel Lucent, uh, it may be implemented in release 5.0. Okay, thanks for the information. Uh, so far, I have not seen uh, anything in the standard, uh, but looks like uh, you guys have plans to do some kind of SON type automation for the core network as well. Okay, very good, thank you. Looks like uh, there is a lot of interest on. I got uh, one more question. Thank you for your question. Uh, are there any SON features uh, available uh, presently or tested? Uh, but with any of the vendor, oh, actually, one song feature um, is called ANR, Automatic Neighbor Relation, and that is already available. So apparently, um, the operators can get that feature, buy that feature from vendors, uh, and that is available. So yes, it is uh, available and tested. So that is one specific example I'm aware of. ANR is available. So automatic uh, configuration of the neighbor list is uh, indeed uh, available. Another aspect is self-optimization. Uh, so the idea here is that now our e -B is already transmitting over there, is communicating with various UEs, it is getting measurement reports from the UEs. It can even talk to other nodes via X2. So now a lot of action is uh, going on. So we have wealth of information to process, and we can process all that data and do various kinds of uh, optimization. We can update the neighbor list that we got initially. We can optimize the coverage, maybe get rid of some coverage holes. Um, we can maximize the number of users, improve throughput, 
may be by uh, reducing interference you maximize signal to interference ratio that will improve throughput uh, you can optimize some parameters maybe cell reselection parameters maybe some uh, timers so you can uh, uh, increase or decrease uh, handover parameters so you can optimize for example we have events a3 events a5 quite popular for handover within lte so maybe you can change uh, the hysteresis, uh, thresholds, and timers for handover events. So a lot of uh, possibilities are there to optimize the parameters. And uh, if we do a good job, then we should improve the performance because we have already invested in the spectrum, in the e-node base, in the core network. We have made that investment. Now you want to get maximum benefit out of your investment. So uh, everything helps. Okay. You want to maximize all those things, best coverage, best capacity, etc., so that you get maximum return on your investment. And the hope is that if these on features are designed well, then they would improve the throughput uh, capacity, uh, better quality, reduce delay, uh, fewer failures, uh, and then maybe uh, you would have to uh, spend very little time in doing the manual planning. Together, uh, uh, all those things should help uh, quite a bit. Uh, rather than working with hundreds of parameters, uh, now the RF engineer can focus on very, very uh, a specific uh, task, um, maybe uh, the SON feature would uh, provide some recommendation to the engineer. So instead of trying uh, 10 different values of a parameter, now the RF engineer can focus on one or two values for that RF uh, parameter. So that is the hope that we should have significant reduction in the manual effort. Uh, we have specific use cases coming up uh, in the session, so we will talk about the details uh, of specific features uh, uh, pretty soon. Uh, but before we get into those specifics, I want to give you first a high-level view. Okay, just one simple example, uh, and I will give you details later. The idea here is that uh, we want to uh, optimize uh, our neighbor list. So basically, uh, our e -Node B has some uh, uh, initial, perhaps, uh, neighbor list uh, and obtained from perhaps some OEM system, and now the UE is sending measurement reports. The measurement reports uh, from the UE, they are processed by some automatic neighbor relation function, so it can work with uh, other neighbors, it can work with OEM system, and update the entry. So maybe uh, initially we may have, let's say, two neighbors, uh, neighbor uh, E node B X, E node B Y, maybe E node B Z. Let's say we have three E node Bs in the neighbor list. But now, uh, based on the U measurement report, maybe we detected some kind of cell and that cell is uh, responsibility of uh, E node B number C. So now we can have the OEM system processing the measurement report, and it will update that. Oh yes, it is a good idea to add that uh, uh, cell, that neighbor. Uh, into the existing neighbor list. So then we can update the entry and we could say, okay, let's add uh, one more E node B C into the neighbor list. So we have done this kind of uh, addition automatically. We have made that decision based on UE measurements and the algorithms that are SON algorithms that are running inside the uh, so-called self-optimization function of SON, and maybe part of that is inside the OEM system. 
So maybe it's a hybrid implementation. So part of Sun function is here, part of Sun function is in the ONF list. So together we have decided to update the neighbor list uh, to add one more in OP. So this is one example. There are many, many other functions, then we'll uh, talk about each function. So optimizing coverage capacity and over and so on. Uh, let me give you just one uh, uh, quick overview on so-called self-healing. What are we trying to do here? So the idea is that we have some SWAN function, self-healing function, and that function has a variety of tests uh, predefined. Okay, so in this case we have a total of n tests. Okay, so one test Maybe it's just checking uh, if uh, uh, we have E node B X to E node B Y connectivity or not. Uh, another test is checking if some software is uh, okay or not. Another test is checking if uh, some baseband chipsets are working well or not. Maybe the power amplifier, do we have power amplifier? Uh, working or not. So we have various tests that focus on different uh, aspects. So maybe what would happen is, uh, let's say we are sending uh, something uh, from power amplifier number one. Okay? But now there is some failure in the cable, power cable. So we are no longer able to send uh, signals from uh, the antenna uh, because there's some uh, loss in terms of connectivity. So then it would uh, be detected by this test that, oh, we lost some kind of uh, cable and we are no longer able to transmit over the air. So that is detected automatically by the test number three and then we would do the analysis. That's what happened. So then we can look at various connectivity uh, points, uh, let's say connecting the baseband chipset to the analog to digital converter, to the uh, filter, to the power amplifier, to the antenna, and so on. So we will have various probes for uh, various points, and then we'll figure out, oh, um, the power amplifier one uh, has lost connectivity toward the antenna, but there is another power amplifier uh, that is uh, still uh, working well. Uh, it has connectivity with the antenna. So now the recovery action says let's uh, make uh, the switch over and keep uh, that antenna with power amplifier 2 now. Do not keep the antenna with uh, power amplifier 1 because a high power amplifier 1 is no longer working. It has lost connectivity. So we will now uh, do the switch over to the second power amplifier and we can resume the RF transmission. So in summary, <coughs> in the self-healing mechanism, we have numerous tests that are running uh, periodically and they are checking various kinds of connectivity and so on. So if something goes wrong, uh, we can uh, detect that automatically. So rather than uh, we getting a lot of customer complaints uh, after few minutes or after hours. We have now this software immediately detecting the problem, doing the deep analysis, and maybe in some cases we can automatically do some recovery. In some cases, we may not be able to do automatic recovery, but at least we have detected the problem uh, very quickly, and we can start working on that, create some kind of trouble ticket, and uh, send somebody to look at that cell site quickly, uh, rather than getting thousands and thousands of customer complaints. Uh, we are able to now uh, reduce the downtime, and we are able to uh, keep most of the customers uh, as they are, without uh, having any significant uh, uh, impact on the per performance. So in summary, a self-healing mechanism helps us detect the problem, uh, analyze the problem, and in some cases even uh, do the recovery automatically. Uh, now, if you reduce the downtime, 
your customers would be happy. Uh, your performance of the network would be be much better. And so overall, you save a lot of um, expenditure. Now, we talked about three mechanisms. Self-configuration, where you know gets the parameters automatically. Self-optimization, where based on real-world measurements from the UEs, enodebase, and so on, we are changing some parameters to improve capacity, throughput, etc. We talked about self-healing, where we detect the problems and in some cases even solve the problems. So those three types of mechanisms are available as part of SON. However, initially, the standard is focusing on the first two, self-configuration and self-optimization. So we would spend a lot of time in the remainder of the session to talk about those two mechanisms. Maybe in future, in one of the releases in future, we will have also something defined for self-healing. But right now, the standard and we would be focusing on configuration and optimization. Optimization would get much more uh, attention here. And of course, as we discussed, there are two states uh, of the sun. It could be in the pre-operational state where the transmitter of the ENOB is not turned on. And after you turn on the RF transmitter, the sun would be working in the operational stage. Okay, we had uh, one question. There are other features such as comp transmission reception. Uh, how is this different from SON? Comp transmission and reception. Uh, that is a release uh, 10 feature which is part of uh, LT Advanced. So think of that as an LT Advanced feature. Um, uh, from one perspective, you could say that it is some kind of extension of uh, the feature that we have today, so-called ICIC, Intercell Interference Coordination. Uh, so ICIC is uh, considered uh, part of a SON feature. And uh, if you view comp transmission reception as an extension of ICIC, then yes, uh, you could say it is also sort of a SON feature. Um, but it would be just a matter of sort of preference whether you formally consider part of SON or not. But comp transmission reception is a part of uh, release 10 LT advance. Okay. Let me ask you a question, uh, which is not applicable. Okay, please uh, pay attention to the word not. <laughs> That's why I have put that in capital letters. I will give you a minute or two to think about this and give me the response. And uh, please uh, participate in the polls. Okay, 80% uh, 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 got it right. Yes, uh, self-optimization is not possible. 
because self optimization means the inner be is in the operational state the sun feature is in the operational state and you are processing the measurements uh, the rf transmitter is already on okay so self optimization is not possible uh, configuration is possible and that is uh, one of the important things you want to take care of in the pre operational state and of course the rf transmitter of the e no b is not yet turned on okay in the pre operational state okay very good uh, thank you for your uh, answer here now before we start talking about uh, the son architecture we have centralized uh, distributed and hybrid uh, let's have a short break and uh, once we come back from the break we will uh, resume with the discussion on the architecture questions using the audio bridge at this time star 7 unmute star 6 mute star 7 unmute any questions to the audio bridge But uh, as you have been doing, please uh, continue to submit your questions through Q and A box. Okay, let's talk about the three types of son architecture that we have available for use. Uh, one is so-called centralized. Another one distributed, and finally hybrid. Hybrid meaning little bit centralized little bit distributed now uh, we have so called itf n interface between the inodb and the ondm system we also have the regular x2 interface between two neighboring inodbs and when we want to implement a specific son function then we will use the help of those interfaces centralized architecture so let's say i have some son function that son function could be entirely implemented inside the ondm system so that would be one example of a centralized son function it is possible that there is a separate box so called stand alone server and that is uh, sitting somewhere maybe next to an onm system and it works with these e node bs talking to their own local onm system this is e node b onm system maybe another vendor has uh, its own separate uh, e node b specific ondm system so those ondm systems would need to then work with uh, this son function that is executing an algorithm to take care of a specific feature now in this example our ITF N interface between E node B and O N F that needs extension because now E node B has to effectively talk to the centralized entity. So now we need to expand these ITF so that we can reach this centralized son entity. Now the good thing about this interface is that we have very easy deployment we have to just put software inside that son um, entity some kind of server and now we can implement that feature uh, for all the e node bs owned by that operator 
it's very very easy to deploy uh, since everyone has to basically fall back to this uh, centralized entity then of course uh, it will be little slower because now it has to process information coming from so many e node base um, for example if you want to do some neighbor list optimization across uh, e node base then these son function can then process the information coming from many many ues uh, here many many ues here and it is processing all that information so there is a lot of data to process and because of that uh, one drawback is uh, the process is little slower if you put something at the e node b we can quickly make the decision but if you put something uh, at some centralized location then it will be slower um, because uh, it is now taking care of uh, thousands and thousands of e node b's so it will take some time before we can uh, take self optimization actions but probably the delay itself is not much of a concern because uh, uh, these functions work sort of slowly you don't want to keep changing something every millisecond or every second so that's the reason we are not too much worried about the delay itself but in general it's uh, something that will take some time because it has to process a lot of stuff that is centralized uh, approach where some centralized location has that feature implemented for example neighbor is optimization now if you implement a son function in a distributed function distributed uh, fashion then it's uh, very very fast for example let's say i put uh, some kind of neighbor is optimization uh, feature in the e node b then our execution of the algorithm is very fast because we just need to work on this area right we are just uh, talking to the immediate neighbors perhaps and we are processing the information coming from our ue is here that's it we can take care of such processing very very quickly and we can start taking some actions start updating the neighbor list so that is the advantage that it is uh, very very fast right? we can process the information very very quickly but uh, the drawback here is that uh, now we have to basically uh, put the software everywhere right all the inodes need to be upgraded with that kind of son feature so the drawback is a uh, little difficult to uh, have uh, this kind of feature available uh, everywhere because now you have to upgrade every e node b with that feature so more difficult in terms of management you have to put software everywhere but uh, the advantage is that uh, it is quite fast we do not have any central processing block that is uh, implementing the feature here uh, the feature is implemented uh, locally in a distributed fashion now uh, we can even support uh, this uh, interfaces here because the neighboring e node bs can provide uh, information because maybe there are some other us that have uh, detected some neighbors and that information is processed here uh, so we are able to get benefit of that uh, locally in the distributed fashion so now if you want to implement these then x2 interface uh, it becomes very important because now two e node bs are exchanging information about the ue measurements and so on so we need to have a, a x2 interface uh, supporting those additional requirements on measurement reports um, so the you should expect more traffic on x2 so when you are provisioning the x2 backhaul capacity you need to keep the uh, this kind of son traffic also in mind uh, it is easier to do the optimization across the vendors because uh, we are now relying on the standard x2 interface so Ericsson e node b uh, and your Alcatel Lucent e node b 
you can talk uh, between those two different uh, vendors e node b via standard ajax2 and now it is possible uh, to do the optimization even across the vendor so that is supported so in summary in the distributed fashion uh, what is happening is the son functionality is at the e node b level okay. and that's the distributed in case of uh, centralized uh, typically it would reside at some ondm system and if it is not formally in the ondm uh, at least there will be some centralized uh, standalone server that will be processing information from many many e node b now for some son function maybe centralized is better for some sun function, maybe distributed is better. Uh, however, for some sun function, uh, you want to have some kind of hybrid approach. So, in the hybrid approach, uh, for a given sun function, uh, part of the information is residing at the centralized entity, such as ONM, and part of the algorithm is executed in the E node B. So, I would give you one example in that case. Let's say we can get some uh, initial uh, um, neighbor list from the centralized one system, and then we can have distributed uh, approach where you are optimizing, you are tuning. The existing neighbor list. So now your neighbor list is modified by some algorithm that is inside the E node B. Okay, and maybe over a long term uh, we can also get that information passed back to the centralized uh, entity, and that will again do some uh, optimization and give us an update on what uh, we should do in terms of the new neighbor list. So maybe uh, we can dynamically, uh, relatively quickly change the neighbor list locally at the node B. And over a long run, maybe a few days or something like that, we can get some updates uh, from the O&M system uh, that is a centralized entity. So that would be an example of uh, a hybrid approach. So a given son function may be implemented in a hybrid fashion. So now you are trying to sort of balance the fully distributed approach and a fully standardized approach. So that's the idea. So of course in that case uh, we need to extend both the ITFN interface and X2. So there will be something going on X2 interface uh, to support the coordination among the neighbors and of course uh, we are talking to the ONM type of central entity so we need to also have some messages supported on the ITF N interface. So you can do some complex uh, stuff at the ONM system and sim relatively simple and quick uh, changes you can make at the E node B. So that is sort of the hybrid. Now remember if you are an operator, you do not need to choose just one type of architecture. You can have some son functions in a centralized fashion. You can have some other son functions implemented in a distributed fashion. And yet another set of son functions could be using some hybrid approach. So it is not that you are uh, stuck to a single architecture. Okay, we have got several uh, questions. <coughs> Let's uh, answer those. Is X2 a must for Sun to work? Now, I would uh, say that in practice, X2 almost becomes mandatory because there are a lot of Sun functions that uh, can benefit from that. So from the benefit perspective, I would just have X2 
between two neighboring E node pieces. Now, is it really a must? The answer is no. You do not need X2 all the time. Okay. So, for example, if you are just doing the centralized uh, approach, then E node we can talk to the O&M system, and O&M system can reconcile the information coming from different E node Bs and create some kind of uh, an optimized neighbor list. So in that case, to optimize the neighbor list, we did not really use X2 interface. We just used the connectivity between the E node B and the O&M system, ITFN interface. So from that perspective, X2 is not really a must to implement that specific function in that specific fashion. However, in practice, I would use X2 so that I have better visibility, maybe some of the things I can do quickly at the e node itself. So in practice, I would use X2 to do certain things. For example, we will see later there is some load balancing optimization, hand door optimization. So maybe it is a good idea to use X2 in that case. But it is not always a requirement. I would use it, so it is desired, but not always a requirement. Some cases it will become a must, especially load uh, balancing between two node bees. But some other sound function, it will come. It can completely be bypassed altogether. Now, why is uh, O&M system not playing any control role? Okay, now. O&M system, even if there is no sound, there will be some O&M system doing something. What we are discussing here is from the sound's perspective. So if you have some self-organizing network function, balancing the load up across e nodeways, optimizing handover parameters, optimizing random access parameters. So if you have some sound function, now, is that sound function solely implemented inside the E node B? If the answer is yes, then that sound function is being implemented in a distributed fashion. So in that case, our ONM system does not play any controlling role in dictating that specific sound function. So as a simple example, if you are doing, let's say, a random access channel optimization. Now, on an algorithm, a SON algorithm that updates RAG parameters, maybe that is fully within e node B. ONM does not even need to worry about that. So in that case, yes, ONM system did not play any control. That is the idea. In a distributed approach, OEM system doesn't do anything for that specific sound function. So hopefully that is uh, clear. We got one question. Uh, X2 is set up between E node base, <coughs> served by the same MA group, and with uh, SON. Do we need X2 even between E node B served by different MME groups? Oh, very good question. Oh, very good question. Now, in general, when you want to do the optimization of something uh, using E node B interaction, then yes, X2 is required. Now, if there is no X2 connectivity between two E node Bs, maybe different MME groups, uh, then you do not uh, need to have X2. Then you will do optimization within a specific set of E node Bs. So it is not necessary that you must have X2 between the E node Bs in a pair. So it is not um, required to have X2 all the time. If you have X2, yes, it will help quite a bit, uh, especially some sound functions. But otherwise, you can always say that we are optimizing within a local network, okay. uh, within, let's say, e node in some tracking area. So we would not worry too much about uh, doing, let's say, load balancing across e node 
uh, that belong to two different economic groups. Uh, we may make that uh, conscious uh, decision. So it is up to us. So uh, do not worry if you do not have an existing X2. It is okay. You can see that that is the scope of your optimization. Okay. You can always limit uh, how many E node Bs you want to have within that uh, function scope. So if you want to do load balancing across E node Bs within a specific area, let's say tracking area or um, the E node Bs talking to the same MME group, you can always have that constraint because you you may not need to do global optimization all the time. Maybe the local optimization is giving you most of the benefits. If you do global, maybe you will get some additional advantage, but it may not be significant to justify uh, setting up of X2 between two E node Bs that belong to two different AI groups. Uh, thank you, very good question. Something uh, else has uh, come up. Does uh, the standard define X2 rules? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so the question is, does the standard define X2 rules? And uh, the comment is, it may be difficult to talk between two vendors. Okay. So the answer is yes. The standard defines all kinds of things we can do with X2. We have the support for, let's say, load balancing. We have the support for exchanging interference-related information. And X2 is fully standardized. Now, the information will be there. So for example, uh, one E-Node B may say to the other E-Node B. So Alcatel Lucent E-Node B may tell Ericsson E-Node B, that uh, I have resource blocks uh, 0 to 10, no interference, minimum interference, and the remaining 12 through 49, lot of interference. So the standard will support transport of such interference-related information. Measurements will be there. Information will be there. Now, how do we use that information? So Ericsson may have a son algorithm that is trying to optimize uh, in a certain way. Alcatel Lucent would have an algorithm to carry the same function to optimize random access channel or load balancing or whatever, but it is a proprietary, so you may have slightly different implementation. So two different vendors may have different son algorithms. So they may be having different inputs or they may be processing the inputs in a different way. So the standard does not specify the algorithm themselves. The standard says that, okay, here are potential inputs, and these are the inputs that you will be able to get from your neighbors or from OEM system, things like that. The standard gives you the tools. Standard gives you the ability to have measurements, have some kind of report, but the actual algorithms you can have your own algorithm, Ericsson, their own algorithm, etc. So from the perspective of the interface, yes, it is fully standardized, completely open, and two different vendors can still exchange information. Again, a very good question. Uh, keep sending your questions. Okay, I will give you a couple of minutes uh, so that you can give me answer to that question.
Okay. So let's see. That primarily implemented at the E node B. Okay, that is called distributed. If you have a SON function at the ONM type system, then it is centralized. And if you have mix, little bit uh, function is at the ONM system and part of the function is executed at the E node B. It is called hybrid. Thank you. Now, we will talk about specific uh, use cases. Basically, how do we apply on to help us with a specific aspect, maybe to optimize handover, optimize neighbor list, etc. So those are the use cases. Here are various use cases that have been identified um, earlier by the standard. So I will just summarize uh, what each of these uh, is trying to do, and then we will go into the details of various use cases. Interference reduction. So basically, as you know, that the most important uh, KPI is throughput. How many megabits per second that the user perceives the cell support? And the throughput is governed by this ratio, signal to interference ratio. We have signal power over interference power. So if you have high value of signal to interference ratio, you will have larger throughput because then you can have higher order modulation, you can have very little channel coding, etc. And that will improve your throughput. If you have low SIR value, then you will have lower throughput. So the idea is that if you increase somehow signal interference ratio, that will improve the throughput. So to increase signal to interference ratio, one of the things we can do is reduce interference. So if we are able to reduce interference, then we will be increasing the signal to interference ratio, resulting in a larger throughput. So one SON use case is to reduce uh, interference so that we can get benefits of higher throughput. One way to reduce interference is to have coordination among neighboring e node bs. So that feature is called ICIC. So someone asked a question: If something is available today in terms of SON, or this is just a dream? So we have two things that are available today, at least. We have Automatic uh, neighbor list creation, ENR, automatic neighbor relation function. So that is available today. And ICIC feature is, from the standard perspective, it is already defined. Some vendors are supporting that now, some will support later. But in terms of general availability, this function and this function, they are available even today. Optimizing random access channel parameters. So if you do that, you are reducing the access time and you can start doing the data transfer relatively soon. So that is the batch optimization. Determining a neighbor list automatically. So 
when the emu would be powered up, maybe there is nothing. But then we give the initial neighbor list and then we optimize that based on measurements. That is ANR function, automatic neighbor relation. Yesterday, somebody asked a question about the PCI, physical layer cell ID. Do you know how many PCIs we have, how many cell IDs? in LTE, 500 something, 512 primary scaling code GM test, 512 uh, PN offsets potentially available in 1X and U, uh, but how about LTE, how many uh, LIDs in LTE, okay, 504, very good, excellent, 0 to 503, very good, okay, so we have those uh, 504 IDs available. 0 to 503, so we have to decide which cell sector should get which PCI. So we can do manual configuration um, by following some kind of rules, or you can let uh, a SON algorithm automatically figure out the PCI. So in today's session, we will see how we can do that automatically. So that is automatic PCI planning. Load balancing. So here uh, the idea is that uh, maybe we have more users in one cell, fewer users in another cell, and some cells uh, are, I mean some users are near the traditional handover border, so they could potentially talk to either of the two cells, so in that case we can try to do some kind of load balancing, so that is mobility related load balancing. Uh, robustness, we just want to make sure that when we do handover, it is indeed uh, successful, okay. so we want to avoid the handover that is too late or handover that is too early, or maybe handover that is to a wrong cell. So we want to make sure that uh, the robustness is there in terms of being able to preserve the session after handover. So there is robustness uh, optimization. We are always interested in getting rid of the coverage holes and enhancing the number of users' capacity and throughput. Also, we want to reduce our utility bills. So we want to save on electricity. So they said, okay, if uh, we are not using some cell, and then let's turn it off and because it is not really a required cell. Maybe it is a capacity cell. Uh, then we can turn off the power amplifier and save that uh, cost. In fact, uh, utility bills are quite... Uh, good portion of the overall uh, operating expenditure for cellular operators. So that could be something that they can directly benefit from. Also, home e node base. If we are not at home, we can turn off the home e node base. So consumers will have to pay uh, less uh, money as the monthly electricity bill. So there is uh, energy savings uh, feature. Those are the use cases uh, that we have been uh, working on in the standard. So we will discuss uh, most of those uh, today in the next uh, couple of hours. Okay, so let's get into the details of those use cases. That's the focus of the remainder of the session. Okay, first. Automatic neighbor relation. What is the objective? The objective is to optimize the neighbor list. Okay. Now, just uh, refreshing your memory. Maybe I should ask you a question. Here is the E node B. Here is the UE. The UE is in the connected mode your RC connection. 
between the UE and uh, the E node B in a given cell. So my question to you is, uh, is it possible for the E node B to provide a neighbor list, LTE neighbor list, for the same carrier frequency to the UE? In the LTE standard, can the E node B tell the UE that here are the neighbors and please look for those neighbors? Uh, yes or no? Is that allowed or not? So it is uh, in the connection mode and we have the IRC connection and so on. So I got at least uh, one reply uh, that says yes. I will wait for 10 15 seconds. Uh, very easy to type yes or no. Hopefully you know what you are talking about. Uh, anyone else who would like to uh, say something? Okay, one more vote for yes. Okay, very good. So far two yes we got. Nobody is uh, disputing uh, that answer yet. Ah. Oh, if you practice democracy, we are in trouble. Because I got three yes, only one no. Okay, unfortunately. The answer is no. When the UE is in the connected mode, meaning we have RC connection, etc., E node B cannot dictate the UE what neighbors to look for, what LTE neighbors on that carrier frequency to look for. UE does blind detection of neighbors. UE looks for LTE neighbors on that carrier frequency autonomously. E node B cannot provide the neighbor list to the UE. Now, if that is the case, why are we worried about neighbor list? Why are we even discussing that? If we cannot even influence what cells UE should look for why are we even wasting our time? Not really. We are not wasting time. See, how to use the neighbor list is very important. So even though we cannot provide the neighbor list to the UE, we will keep the neighbor list. Let's say neighbors uh, with cell ID, let's say 0, 1, 2, 10, 11, 12, something like that. Let's say this is our neighbor list. Uh, these are the PCIs, physical air cell ideas. Even though we cannot give that to the UE, it is extremely critical to make a handover decision because our UE will send a measurement report. So it would say that it has detected a cell number, let's say, 10. So then we know that, oh, it is part of the neighbor list. So we should allow handover. On the other hand, if the UE says that I have detected a cell with PCI number 20, then we check that, okay, do we have number 20 in the neighbor list? Do not. So, if we are confident about our neighbor list, let's say we have optimized the neighbor list. So, if the UE reports something that is not in the neighbor list, we should not allow handover to that cell. Maybe that cell is many, many miles away and is overshooting energy into the current uh, location area. It is not supposed to do that, but it is doing that. Maybe we need to do some tuning. We need to do down tilting of the antenna in that far away cell. So that is the benefit. So in summary, even though we do not give the name list to the UE, when the UE is in the connected mode, we still have to have a very good neighbor list to decide 
should we allow handover or not? Now, this is one example. However, there is another possibility. Maybe we should add that cell number 20 to the neighbor list because it is reported uh, with very strong RSRP and it is in that neighborhood. So it is uh, within a couple of miles from the current location. So in that case, perhaps we should even tune our neighbor list and add that cell to the neighbor list. So it depends on what the algorithm decides. So a song algorithm would look at the measurement reports, uh, current neighbor list, things like that, to make a decision. Who should be in the neighbor list? Who should not be in the neighbor list? So uh, the idea is to create a very good optimized neighbor list uh, so that we have basically a minimum call drops as a result of handover. At the cell edge, we get better throughput. And of course, uh, we are doing this automatically, so no human intervention in this specific example. So what do we need? Uh, we need to have UE giving uh, measurement reports. Perhaps E will be also has some information, maybe initial neighbor list, or maybe uh, some history on what kinds of uh, neighbors have been reported by UEs. So basically, once we have processed all that information, uh, the end result is uh, an optimized neighbor list. Now remember, the exact algorithm that decides the neighbor list, that is not in the standard because it is proprietary. So you guys will have your own uh, ANR algorithm. Okay. So here is how the standard supports uh, these uh, ANR functions, one function. In the E would be, there would be some kind of table, a neighbor relation table. So we would have neighbor relation number one, number two, number three. Now let's talk about number uh, one, neighbor relation number one. So we have this uh, table inside this E node B. Now we are saying that there is a target cell identity number one. Target cell identify number one. So this would be some kind of uh, physical layer cell number, let's say 10, and there would be some global identity also, let's say number X. So we know exactly what that cell is. And then there are some attributes. So one attribute is that do not remove. Warning sign to the SON algorithm. Please do not remove that cell from the neighbor list. It is critical. And why? Because maybe, let's say this uh, table is for cell number 9. This is cell number 9. And then we have cell 10 and cell 11. So what we are seeing is that this is that cell, the sector that is controlled by the same E node B. So the UE could be moving into that cell anytime. So we should not remove that cell from the neighbor list. So we should always keep that. So that is an example. Uh, now, uh, it is possible that, uh, and we don't have to worry about extra interest. But let's say there is another cell. Uh, that cell, uh, we should not allow handover. So maybe what might have happened in the past is uh, some UEs would have reported that PCI number two. But then whenever we try to do handover to that uh, cell, it uh, drops uh, because of uh, whatever reason, maybe the RF environment is pretty bad or whatever. So then, based on that knowledge from the past, we said, okay, we should not allow handover to that cell. And finally, uh, there may be some cell, and uh, uh, that cell we could say, okay, 
uh, handover is allowed with that cell but uh, unfortunately maybe that belongs to another MMA group so currently we do not have X to connect it with, it, with that specific uh, cells E node B so uh, we should not try to do X2 based handover uh, we should try S1 based handover and seek MMA's help in executing the handover process so in summary we have this kind of table with certain attributes and the ONM system would provide this initial list uh, the list of attributes etc and now on an ongoing basis dynamically based on the RRC signaling measurement reports and things like that uh, UE is reporting measurements uh, for different uh, U, different cells in the neighborhood and then the neighbor detection function would detect that oh there is some new neighbor being reported maybe uh, based on the knowledge that handover are always failing to a specific cell we have some neighbor removal function that is in charge of uh, purging the neighbor from the list getting rid of that from the neighbor list and uh, whether we are adding something or removing something uh, we are uh, sending that uh, information to the neighbor relation table management function and this management function interacts with the ONM system and gives the update to the E node B and we can update the table. So in summary, from the perspective of the standard, what do we standardize? We standardize part of the structure of the table. Uh, we say that, okay, uh, we will have some measurement reports that would be supporting the SON function because the UE needs to detect some neighbors and provide the uh, measurement. So that is what is within the scope of the standard. Uh, establishing logical entities, logical functions within that ANR function, creating uh, entries uh, uh, for the table and so on. Okay. So this is how we could potentially implement ANR function and this is available today uh, in the standard and some vendors support that today some would support a uh, little bit later in a future release but it is widely available in general for use okay now we will take one specific uh, example of how we could potentially uh, add some neighbor to the existing member list. This is the E node B that we are interested in. So this E node B has some kind of table, neighbor table, neighbor relation table. Now what is happening is um, a UE that is uh, served by this E node B is sending a report, a measurement report. So it says that I have detected cell number 7, PCI 7, that is this cell. And the RSRP, let's say pretty good, uh, minus uh, 85 dBm. So reference signal receipt power minus 85 dBm. Now, it is possible that uh, we know about that or we may not know about that. So now we will see, okay, currently I do not have any PCI number 7 in my neighbor list. So let me make sure who that cell really is. So we can ask the UE to provide global cell ID. And that is called uh, ECGI, e Utron Cell Global Identity. It uniquely identifies the cell on the planet because part of that ECGI is the PLM identity, mobile country code, mobile network code. So now within the operator, we can always separate the cells. Uh, and two different operators would have two different PLM IDs. So this way we can have a globally unique cell identity ECGI. So we are requesting the UE to identify that 
cell to figure out the ECGA for that cell, number cell. So now UE goes back to that cell uh, and looks for that uh, ECGI which is uh, present on system information block one. So it will detect the ECGI and give that back to the ENODB that okay that is uh, identity. We are just making up some number, let's say number 27, some kind of number, ECGI. So now that information is used by the ANR function to update because this is a pretty good uh, signal send and we think that yes, uh, that is a very valid uh, handover candidate cell. And then we will tell the O&M system that by the way we have uh, detected a very strong global cell here. Uh, can you please give me the IP address of uh, the E node B that is in charge of that uh, specific cell. Then ODM system would say, okay, IP address A, B, C, D for that E node B. So in future, uh, we can talk to that target E node B uh, and uh, do the handover to that cell uh, that is controlled by E node B number two. So in summary, this is optimization of the neighbor list. Our e -node B has already been turned on. It is already talking to the UEs. It is processing the measurement reports. And here, um, this is a sort of uh, distri uh, distributed uh, approach where the algorithm that updates the table is uh, in the ENB. And now, if we have got the list initial list from the ONM system, then it would be called a hybrid approach because we already got something from the ONM system. Now we are just updating that. So here, uh, that SON function, you can consider that to be a hybrid SON function because little bit of that function is executed on ONM system and little bit of that function is uh, carried out by the E node B. So it is uh, an example of uh, a hybrid approach in that case. Now we talked about just uh, updating the neighbor list for the LT technology itself, but we have in the standard a lot of other scenarios. For example, we can have the UE that is going between two different technologies. So inter-radio access technology uh, mobility is also supported. So maybe we have detected uh, some cell here uh, that belongs to some other technology. So we are talking about LT here, but then our UE has uh, detected a UMTS uh, primary scrambling code and it has uh, sent back the measurement report. We get the global cell identity and finally uh, we know that, oh, that is controlled by uh, uh, some specific uh, UMTS uh, node B and RNC. And then we can uh, again update the entry so we can support uh, optimized uh, handover from LTE to UMTS. See, in this example, maybe we had a completely blank neighbor list for internet neighbors, but now we have started creating an entry into that uh, internet table. So now we do not need to manually populate the internet neighbor relationship table. We are relying upon the UE measurement to uh, create the entries for that table, this kind of uh, table, or internet handle. Okay, so hopefully the basic idea behind this ANR is clear. Uh, let's uh, address a uh, couple of questions we have got. The question is, uh, does the target cell always send out the global cell ID? Yes, sir, that is part of SIB1, so it is uh, broadcasting that information. So periodically, let's say this is SIB1, so 80 milliseconds. So with the periodicity of uh, 80 milliseconds, and the E node B sends out uh, ECGI for a given cell, yes. Uh, in the ANR, another question, for the ANR example, I wonder if the UE supports 
departing of global sail id okay so the basic question here is uh, from the q and a box is does the ue really support uh, reporting of global sail id the answer is yes you will have that in the rrc signaling messages <coughs> so if the e node is happy with the pci we do not need to ask but if you want to confirm really confirm the pci because if you want to get the ip address etc and then uh, then we can use that rrc signal so yes the u is basically support but it is only on a need basis let me give you one example where it is not needed uh, let's say when we powered up uh, we talked to the neighboring uh, e node bs right so we might have already got the pci from our neighboring e node b so when some ue reports a pci that belongs to an existing e node b then we do not have to ask that ue that oh give me the cell id ecgi for the cell because we already know about the e node b about the pci everything so this is uh, needed only if we are not sure or if we have not got that pci in the past so the steps 3 5 they are sort of optional here we did not know about pci 7 or maybe we wanted to confirm that's why we got uh, us help in resolving that identity but uh, those steps may not be required fault at all time an x2 may or may not uh, have existed before we update the table so if uh, we already had uh, some table coming from the ondm system and the table already had all the cells uh, of e node b number 2 we already know the ip address we we already have x2 interface then we do not need to execute many of these steps here okay but in general we may or may not have x2 we may have to establish a new x2 connectivity if this is the first time we are detecting that neighbor okay okay uh, and uh, of course uh, if the answer is not satisfactory maybe you want better explanation you want more details more specifics please ask a follow up question okay if uh, i do not get any follow up question then i would assume that uh, you are doing just fine okay so please screen if you do not get your answer okay that is one function another function is optimizing coverage and capacity so coverage basically yeah, we want to uh, get rid of some coverage holes and Uh, capacity optimization we want to maximize the number of users we can support now in general uh, i'm not too much worried about capacity for packet data systems such as lte uh, what i'm more concerned about is throughput so here when you see the term capacity think throughput okay? how do we maximize throughput so let's say we have some fun function that is uh, taking care of this kind of function then um, once the swan function has been executed uh, what can we expect what are the end results we can expect that the coverage has improved uh, fewer call drops we can support more users the cell throughput is better uh, cell edge performance is better and of course uh, in terms of uh, Uh, money we should see that we have saved quite a bit because uh, we avoided the human intervention uh, normally what happens is uh, uh, the operator needs to do some kind of drive test periodically to make sure that things are working well maybe we get lot of customer complaints in a specific geographic area then we have to send some folks to do drive testing collect data uh, 
uh, do the processing and figure out what is wrong. Uh, if you have some algorithm that is uh, looking at huge amounts of data, gigabytes and gigabytes of measurements and so on, uh, automatically then we can avoid all that human intervention and save a lot of money. N not only money, we can save a lot of time as well. Uh, maybe we can detect problems earlier before we get an onset of uh, thousands of customer complaints. We can even solve that problem. So that's the, the hope that a good uh, algorithm would uh, detect the problems and uh, hopefully solve the problem as well. Now this kind of algorithm uh, can use inputs such as uh, measurement reports coming from the UE. So, uh, what kind of uh, RSRPs, RSRQs are being uh, available uh, and within a given cell what CQI reports uh, are being reported, uh, what kind of timing advance commands uh, we have sent to the UEs. Because remember for OFDM system to work well, uh, we need to make sure that the signals coming from different UEs are received at the E node B almost at the same time. So we have given some timing uh, commands to the close by UEs to delay the transmission time. We have asked UEs near sellers to uh, advance the transmission times and so on. So we can have some kind of history to figure out that, oh, whether the UE is close by or the user is far away from the cell site. Uh, also, how many times the calls have dropped uh, and so on. Uh, we can use all those kinds of uh, inputs uh, to figure out that, okay, maybe uh, we have some coverage hole, so we need to uh, do some antenna down tilt change. Instead of uh, five degree, maybe we should do only three degree down tilt. Uh, maybe we can uh, tune some other parameters. Uh, some things we can do automatically. So down tilt uh, you can do automatically. Uh, however, certain things uh, we cannot. For example, uh, uh, depending on the type of antenna, if you want to change the azimuth, you have to physically move the antenna. So that is uh, not possible real time. You have to send somebody and they have to climb the tower to change the azimuth. Also antenna height, of course, uh, if you want to change the antenna height from 30 meters to 35 or so, then we have to ask somebody to again change the antenna height. So some things are possible uh, uh, automatically. Some things we have to just uh, uh, suggest some corrective actions and somebody needs to physically do that work, such as changing the antenna type rather than narrow beam width, maybe wider beam width antenna we need to buy and, in, and then install. So it depends what we, uh, re what remedy we choose. Um, normally, we do not worry too much about the transmit power. We maximize the transmit power, uh, so that is not typically the case that we would change the transmit power. Uh, operators may choose to boost the downing reference signal power compared to the regular data subcarrier. So that is one option uh, that may be on the table for us to tune, but the idea here is that once you have made the changes, maybe antenna down tilt or whatever, then we have hopefully addressed some coverage holes uh, and uh, we have reduced interference to maximize throughput. So here's some uh, examples of uh, parameters we could have. So the parameters we may be able to play with is the type of the antenna, narrow beam width antenna, wide beam width antenna. Uh, electrical down tilt is uh, easy to change uh, automatically. Uh, so those are some examples. So as I said, transmit power, I wouldn't worry too much. We normally maximize the transmission of power. So do not worry about that. But we have basically the information uh, coming from the UE in terms of RSRP, RSRQ. Uh, we can detect some coverage problems there. Maybe if the calls have dropped, uh, then 
uh, we know from that that oh uh, we have some call drop problem maybe we have low throughput so the traffic counters would dictate that uh, we look at some uh, ways of improving the throughput so we could get uh, planning tool involved so here there is something that is done offline meaning uh, we provide some kind of report uh, to engineers and the engineers will then use the planning tool to uh, change the antenna parameters okay so it is possible that some things we can do without absolutely no human intervention but in some cases we may have to use uh, uh, engineers to sort of uh, fill the gap now before we get too far let me explain something that would be quite uh, useful when we talk about the self organizing network functions Uh, so an algorithm can work in two different modes open loop and closed loop okay open loop means that the algorithm here sun function it has processed some measurement and it has decided some parameters let's say parameter x they should be set to uh, let's say minus 90 dbm there is some other parameter y maybe some kind of timer so let's say 2 seconds so these are recommendations given by that automatic son algorithm now there are two possibilities one possibility is we change that automatically change parameters without human intervention so this algorithm automatically changes the settings of those parameters okay that is called closed loop another possibility is uh, human beings would process the information and they would then manually change the parameters so in this case what happened the algorithm has done majority of the work so the complex work of optimizing parameters is done by that algorithm and the algorithm makes recommendations and those parameter recommendations are analyzed by the engineer that is it good is it in our interest to change the parameters that way does those parameter settings make sense that engineers can use the help of uh, design tools a tool planet uh, things like that to make sure that or some simulations to make sure that those parameter settings indeed make sense or maybe we can uh, use this as the starting point and try some parameter settings that are close by so we can try minus 80 8 minus 90 minus 92 dbm we can try 1 second 2 second 3 seconds so now we can focus on a very narrow range of parameters and see which uh, parameter settings work the best this is an example of an open loop implementation where the algorithm has done majority of the work 
Okay. But the algorithm is not automatically changing the parameters on its own. We have humans taking a look at the recommendations and then in charge, uh, then uh, we are in charge of really changing the parameters. I am personally comfortable with the open loop approach. There is a lot of value in that because now we do not need to blindly search for optimum parameter settings from minus 80 dBm all the way to minus 110 dBm. We have now much narrow range to focus on. So that should reduce the amount of work that we need to do in trying to figure out parameters from a seemingly infinite range of parameters. So the complexity of the problem has been reduced significantly so I'm personally comfortable with open loop. A closed loop is a little tricky because um, I would be worried if some algorithm automatically changes the parameters and uh, that uh, those parameters are as good as the person who has designed that algorithm. Right? So if that algorithm is not designed well, then you may have a lot of problems. Instead of uh, getting 10% call drops, you may get 20% call drops. So, uh, I'm a little concerned about the closed loop. So, at least there is a lot of value in the open loop approach. It simplifies the problem. It gives you something to work with initially. So, we are not completely eliminating human beings, but we are using human beings to focus on specific areas with specific ranges of parameters. So, that is extremely valuable. And I think that operators would be much more willing to try out this on function in the open loop uh, approach. So whatever algorithms we are talking about uh, in general, they could be operating in the open loop mode or closed loop. But uh, I'm told on the benefits of open loop. A uh, closed loop is a uh, little tricky to maybe risky. So when I uh, teach these kind of on topics uh, uh, at, at operators, then RF engineers get worried. That, oh, these algorithms are changing all the things, uh, then what happened to my long-term employment? LT is supposed to be long-term employment. And if some algorithms are doing my work, then what will I do, right? It, it becomes short-term employment instead of long-term employment. But I tell them, do not worry. Uh, Having closed loop uh, operation is very risky. So, actually, you should use, uh, you should perceive SON as uh, some kind of an assistant that algorithm is helping you do your work uh, better, more efficiently, and that's the way it should be looked at. So, do not worry about uh, <laughs> job security, right? Uh, the, as I said, right, it is uh, risky to let some algorithm change something on the fly, uh, but it is uh, helping us uh, uh, focus on specific topics, specific problems. So that is sort of uh, how we should look at this song. Okay, let's uh, get back to the function themselves, use cases. But as I said, uh, this is an important concept, whether it works in open loop or configuration, or close loop. And I think we might have got one question. Let me see if uh, we have addressed that. Okay, the question what happens when E mode B encounters maximum X2 interface? Will we create new X2 links uh, if the new neighbor is added? Sure. If uh, we think that this is a really good neighbor that we should allow handover to, then uh, we can always add a new X2 link using the help of uh, ONM system, using the help of even MME. So, yes, we can always do that, yes. Okay. So that is uh, optimizing for capacity and coverage. Another uh, useful uh, use case is 
TCI configuration, physical layer cell ID configuration. As uh, we discussed a little earlier, there are uh, 504 um, cell IDs. Now, one thing about the cell IDs, of course, uh, we know from the previous sessions, we have 168 secondary synchronization sequences and three primary, and the combination of the two uh, is giving you 504 PCIs to play with. Okay? Now, one thing uh, that uh, we should keep in mind, and it is good, is that all 504 PCIs are available. So that is the good news. All 4 and 4 are available. If you compare that with, let's say, 1X, TVDO, then even though we have 512 PL offset, if you use a pilot increment of 4 in the network, then you have only 128 real PL offsets available for you because of pilot increment. So the good news here is that you no longer have that kind of constraint. You can indeed use all the 504 just like you can use all 512 primary scrambling codes in UMTS. So PCI is uh, closer to primary scrambling code than PN offsets because here we have the possibility of using all for and info. Okay, so that is some background on PCI. We have something uh, on the limiting of follow-up question. So X2 neighbor can be done through the system. X2 neighbor is very, very easy to do through the system automatically. Uh, you do not need to have manual in, in involvement in that case. Because the MME uh, and the ONM system would know about the IP addresses uh, of the e -nodes, so that is not a problem. <coughs> okay, uh, we have now 504 PCI. So when you activate uh, e -node B, New e -node B. It has three cells, alpha, beta, gamma. And you have to allocate uh, each of those cells a PCI. So how do we do that? Now, some tools will just, network planning tools will just randomly allocate PCIs. So that is one way. But now, oh, another way is uh, do some systematic planning of PCI. So if you do a good job of PCI planning, uh, using some specific mechanism, some approach, then you can uh, get uh, better interference properties for uplink and downlink. So a good uh, PCI planning is quite uh, beneficial. Uh, we have five-day IRF network planning design course, and we talked about how to do PCI planning as part of that course. So there are some nice techniques. However, if you want to do that automatically, without using RF engineers, without any human involvement, then how do we do that? Okay. So there are a couple of uh, approaches available. So I will mention those. In, if you look at the objectives uh, slide in the PDF file, you will see a list of references for uh, the session. And I will give you one very easy to read reference for some. Uh, 
36300. Okay, very easy. So there is a section on Sun, okay, and that will give you very good introduction to Sun. So there are two general ways of allocating a PCI through Sun. There is something called centralized assignment. And something uh, called distributed assignment. Uh, centralized assignment means that some entities such as O and M tells the E node B that okay for a given cell use. PCI number 10. So what is happening here? One specific value is given to the E node B for a specific cell. That's it. So ONM made that decision and that is it. So there is a certain function inside ONM and that made the decision that for a cell in E node B, here is the specific value. There's one way. It's called centralized assignment. There is something called distributed assignment. So in that approach, the sum function inside the ONM would give a list of PCIs, a set. E node B now has received multiple potential PCI values. Now what do we do? Now there are a couple of things we can do. Either we will pick one PCI out of the set randomly and do that. Or we can say let's restrict the set using perhaps uh, UE measurements and using uh, okay now okay let's not mention that here we mentioned that for the next step using neighbor E node B list. So if we know that oh in the neighboring E node B's we have certain PCIs being used uh, then we can eliminate some of those PCIs because we do not want to reuse the same PCIs that the neighbors are using. So we can do that restriction. Or you can have a restriction based on a receiver at the E node See, normally what happens, E node B is listening to the uplink, right? So E node B is getting measurements from the UEs and so on. But now what we can do is we can have a special downlink receiver. So after we power up the E node B, we can activate that uh, downlink receiver. So now the E node B acts like a UE and it will look for LTE cells in that neighborhood. So whatever cells it detects at high RSRP levels, it will try to avoid those PCIs because they are already being used in that geographic area. So that is a quite nice idea to come up with a good initial 
PCI set the, to choose our PCI from. So in summary, in the distributed assignment, the SWAN function at the ONM gives some kind of uh, list of set, list of uh, PCIs, and our e we can restrict using A, B, or C type approach, and then whatever is left, we can randomly pick PCI. So those are the two basic uh, assignment approaches uh, available through SON. The idea behind the PCI configuration through some automated means is that we would avoid using the same PCI in that neighborhood. And since it is a cell phone configuration, we eliminated the human intervention. So the hope is that the PCI that we choose uh, is not experiencing any conflicts with the PCIs already in use in that specific geographic area. So let's take one example scenario here. This is new E node B, new E node B. And then we can uh, use the help of Existing E node B, so here is E node B with some PCI, uh, E node B with a PCI, and the E node B has already got some PCIs in the neighbor list. So it can give that neighbor list to the new E node B in step four. So we got already some idea on the PCIs being used in that neighborhood. We already have some idea. And additionally, we can uh, pick, based on that, we can pick some PCI and then make sure that there is no conflict. And the basic goal is just uh, making sure that we do not uh, use the PCI that is already part of the neighbor list coming from the neighboring E node base. We can randomly pick. Now it is possible that uh, once we randomly pick a PCI and then uh, our UEs will start uh, making measurements and then if we find a conflict, right? Um, maybe this UE detected uh, some PCIs from this side of the geographic area, then it is possible to even change the PCI. So it, it is not that you are stuck to your PCI. So if you pick some PCI and it happens to conflict a little later, then you can always re-change uh, the PCI and update your neighbors. So that is what we are showing here that maybe we pick some uh, PCI, but uh, there is some collision. And if we find the PCI being used somewhere else, then uh, we will inform the neighbors uh, and we will change the PCI. So uh, part of the SWAN function would be uh, making sure that we resolve any potential conflicts. And once we change, then we will update the ONM system and we will uh, update the neighbors as well. Okay, time for a question. I will give you two, three minutes to work on this one. Almost 70% uh, uh, got it right. See, we could have an initial neighbor list when we power up the E node B. So we have not yet turned on the E node B transmitter, right? 
So during the pre-operational state, as part of self-configuration, we could get some initial nebulist. And then, based on the measurements from the UE, by talking to the neighboring E node Bs, we can always update the neighbor relationship table. So that would be self-optimization that after we have started uh, talking to the UEs, uh, uh, we are able to change the neighbor list. We are automatically changing the neighbors. That would be part of self-optimization. So that's why it's a com combination. Okay, very good. Uh, time for a short break. And once we come back from the break, uh, we will uh, take care of the remaining uh, use cases. And of course, uh, think about uh, any questions uh, you may want to ask after we come back. Mute. Star 6, mute. Star 7, unmute. So we'll um, keep moving forward and please uh, uh, keep sending your questions, uh, comments through Q&A box. Okay. Uh, we have one question through live meeting. X configuration is when radio is off, so no UE measurements can be reported for AMR. Mm, okay. So, uh, technically speaking, uh, self-configuration occurs in the pre-operational state. So, in that case, the RF transmitter is of transmitter. So, the E node B transmitter is off. So, it is possible that we may use the receiver, uplink receiver, to look at the UE reports that are actually destined for other cells. It would be a little complex to do that, but it is possible to do that. So, let's say you are E node B, you are not transmitting anything but you can listen to the UEs who are sending something to their own e node bees, their serving cells. So it is conceivable that we could have that. And again, as I said, there is one more possibility. We can even have uh, e node b uh, downlink receiver, right? At least it can look for uh, PCIs in that neighborhood. Okay. That is that. Let's uh, talk about a couple of more use cases. One is mobility robustness optimization. So robustness. Here we want to make sure that the handover decision that we are making is an appropriate one, meaning. Uh, we are not uh, making handover that is too early or too late or maybe a handover to a wrong cell altogether. So we want to avoid all those uh, problematic scenarios. So if you have done the handover parameter tuning well, then you should see a mm, lot of uh, success rate, very high success rate for the handover. So the idea here behind uh, mobility robust and optimization is that we automatically adjust and or thresholds, hysteresis, timers, etc. so that uh, we take, uh, so that we can uh, make the hand over decision uh, properly at the right time, at the right place, and we are not uh, basically causing any significant number of hand over failures. So what will go as an input uh, into that algorithm? Uh, we will look at uh, existing uh, handover failure cases uh, uh, to figure out whether 
the handover was too early or it was too late or to a wrong self. So let me just uh, give you some uh, basic idea how do you know it was too late or too, uh, too early, things like that. So we want to avoid those three scenarios. It's too early handover, too late uh, handover to wrong. Now, how do you know it is uh, too early a uh, handover? So let's say what happened uh, the UECM measurement report. So this is cell 10. Then we send handover command. There is some other cell here. So you are asking you to go to some other cell, PCI 20. But then we have handover failure. We are not able to successfully complete the handover with the target, and we will do the cell selection again and we will choose to connect with the source cell. So we ask the U to go to some other cell too early because when the UE tries to go to another cell, the call drops, the handover failure occurs and the UE goes back to the source cell. So we made a decision a little too early. We should have waited until the source really becomes worse and the target really becomes much better. So we made a sort of decision in a rush that, oh, let's do the handover. We should have waited a little longer. So that is how you detect too early a handover. Meaning, after failure, our UE goes back to the original cell, source cell. Same thing uh, from another perspective. So here we have PCI 10 and we have measurement report, we have handover command. Yeah, however, we have no uh, handover connection made with the target. The so UE is supposed to send basically, uh, okay, here is RRC connection reconfiguration message. So the UE is supposed to send this message, uh, RRC RRC connection reconfiguration complete. So our UE is supposed to send that message. But our E node V that is controlling cell 20 never receives that message because there is a really lot of interference and the call has already dropped. So now the UE has no handover successfully completed with the target. 
to it has to now look for another cell. And what it finds? It finds PCI20 as the best cell. So new RRC connection with PCI20. So it will do random access, etc., to talk to PCI20. So here what happens? After the failure, the UE really picks the target. So it was the correct cell. But the problem is we made the decision too late. We should have made that decision early so that we would have good uh, radio conditions uh, uh, with the target and we should have uh, successful handover. But unfortunately, we held on to that old cell for a long time. So signal uh, was becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. So maybe when we told UE to go to another cell, maybe UE never even received our handover command because there was already a lot of interference coming from this target. So maybe we could not even detect the message and because of that handover command that is missed, now we were not able to send the handover completion message with the target. So we should have made the decision a little early, giving the UE opportunity to succeed with the target. And then there is another possibility that uh, we ask the UE to go to, let's say this is cell 10, we said go to 20, here is uh, 20, but we have no connection set up with PCI number 20. So no handover completion message received at PCI 20. In fact, what happens? Handover fails, and now the UE chooses completely new cell. So not original cell, not target cell, completely different. So it means we missed PCI number 30. With PCI 30 as the best channel condition with that UE. So we should have picked number 30 as the target, not number 20. So we try to do a handover to a wrong cell. And number 20, we should not have done that. We should have picked number 30. So in summary, these are some examples of potential handover issues. Either the handover is too early or too late or handover to completely wrong cell. So to help us avoid all those things, we have this SON function. So the SON function will see that, oh, are we making too early handovers? Are we making too late handovers? Or the handovers are toward different wrong cell. So when those things happen, the SON function will detect those events and it would adjust the handover parameters uh, so that uh, we minimize occurrence of those handover problems. So we should expect that the handover failures are now much reduced because we modified the parameters. So examples of the parameters that we can tune we can change the handover threshold, uh, history races, uh, and time to trigger. Those are three uh, examples of parameters. Then we have mobility load balancing optimization. So for load balancing and mobility, there are two things here. Mobility means that we would change and over parameters. And load balancing means that hand over is done to balance load. 
traffic load. And not because of the child condition. So our radio environment is pretty good. We do not need to do handover because of poor channel conditions. We have very good channel conditions with our currently serving cells. However, we want to do handover because maybe our serving cell is congested, lot of users, but the neighboring cell is doing nothing, waiting for the users. So we can give some of the users to that cell. If the users are in the border region, they can theoretically talk to either of the two cells, either the heavily congested serving cell or the E node B that has no work to do. That is the idea. That we would rely upon handover parameters. We will change the handover parameters such that we make it easy for the UEs to go to the cell that is lightly loaded. We would not have needed to do handover because of channel conditions. The radio environment is pretty good. However, the reason that we want to do handover is to balance the load, to give every e a little bit of work to do. That is the idea. Okay. So again, uh, if you do that uh, well, then you will have uh, balanced load. Overall, you can support more users. Your throughput will be better because if the cell is congested, a lot of users are fighting for the same finite resources, same 50 resource blocks in 10 megas bandwidth. So if you distribute the load, now we have 50 resource blocks in one cell. Another set of 50 resource blocks in another cell. So now you have more resource blocks. So throughput for the users, throughput for the cell would go up because now you are using two cells rather than just one heavily congested cell. So that is the idea. We can increase the number of supportable users, increase the throughput. And since you are doing this uh, automatically, then we minimize uh, human intervention. But as I said, uh, I wouldn't completely eliminate uh, human intervention. Uh, I would just run these kind of algorithms in an open loop fashion. So I will get recommendations from this algorithm and I will make sure, do they make sense? Should I change the values the way it is being recommended? Or maybe I should try a couple of other options, a couple of other parameter settings uh, around the suggested values, things like that. Run in open loop. then. Uh, you are getting best of both the worlds. You have minimized a lot of complexity, and at the same time, whatever parameters you decide, they will give a pretty good performance. So, the question is, if we want to do load balance, we need to know how much load we have, right? So, that's the reason we have extra interface now taking an active role here. The neighboring E node B is E node B1, E node B2. They will see how many resource blocks are we using. Uh, what is the guaranteed bitrate resource block that we have reserved for GBR bearers? And we have some non-GBR bearers, so things like that. How many resource blocks on average we are using? How many maximum blocks we are using on average? What is the guaranteed uh, resource block utilization? All those things are calculated by E node B's and they will exchange such information with the neighboring E node B's. So now you see standardization is important because on X2 interface we would have to exchange this information. If the standard doesn't say anything, then we have to have some proprietary implementation and that will not work because maybe this E node B is Alcatel Lucent, uh, another E node B is from Ericsson. So if they follow some proprietary ways, then they cannot even talk to each other. 
having a standardized open interface like X2 and using that to support some functions, it will make sure that even across different vendors, we can implement one function. Very, very important. We have open, standardized, fully defined interfaces. So that is uh, mobility load balancing uh, optimization. Then we have another use case. And this one is random access chain. So we have so-called physical random access chain. Now, do you remember the use of uh, physical random access chain? I will give you a hint. This is an uplink channel. Uplink channel. And it is not normally dedicated to a UE. So it is an uplink channel and not dedicated to a UE typically. What is the use of this channel? Physical random access channel. Waiting for you to type the answer. Okay, I got at least something. Very good. So I got two for UE to access the system. Very good, very good. So when to send sort of connection request. Very good, very good. So when the UE does not have any resources for uplink transmission and it wants to talk to the network, then the only channel that is available to the UE is physical random access channel. So we send so-called preamble, random access preamble on the channel. In fact, there is a difference between a 3G random access channel and LT. So UMTS, EVDO versus LTE, random access channel. See, in 3G system, on the random access channel, physical random access channel, we send so-called preamble or access probe, and we can send a signaling message. However, in LTE, it is different. The only thing that goes over that uh, random access channel is random access preamble. There is no signaling message ever sent on that random access channel. The only thing that goes over the random access channel is the preamble. Much simpler. The only thing e be looks for is the preamble. There are 64 cell-specific preambles. Cell-specific. So one cell has one set of 64 preambles, another cell has another set of 64 preambles, and so on. The e be is always watching for one of those 64 preambles. Is anyone sending me a preamble or not? If it detects the preamble, then it will send the response, random access response. That is the idea. So now we have this random access channel. And if you choose the parameters properly, then we have very high success or rate in terms of accessibility. Many, many UEs can contact the network exactly at the same time. So we reduce the connection setup delay. We can get back onto the data transport very, very quickly. That is the motivation why we should be worrying about a random access channel optimization. But the benefits that you can expect is that they are basically all set up time much shorter. Even the handover could be shorter. Now, uh, you may re remember, but just refreshing your memory, in LTE, there is no soft, softer handover. Over UE, you communicate with a single cell at any given instant. So there is hard handover. So when the UE goes from one cell to another, in fact, uh, when we want to do handover to this new target, we have to use random access channel. Because we do not have any uh, dedicated resource blocks allocated to the UE when we do the handover. So the UE will have to use a sort of uh, this random access channel. 
So if you have good uh, random access channel parameters, then we reduce the handover delay because you can quickly complete the handover process. Now, I, uh, let me just take a couple of minutes on that uh, because the preambles that we have, these uh, 64 preambles, there are preambles uh, dedicated to the process of handover. So let's say cell alpha, PCI 100, I have 0, 1, 2, 64 preambles, random access preambles. So what I can do is uh, I can have a set, maybe 0 to 51. Well, I have 52 preambles for two random access for the users that are in that same set. And then the remaining 52, 53, whatever, up to 63. Those ones I will reserve for handover UEs. Meaning UEs that are coming from cell X to cell alpha. So they are coming into our cell PCI. So the users that are coming into our cell, PCI 100, we have reserved some PCIs. The reason for that is we will tell those users, let's say user number 1 here. So during the handover process, We will tell the user that I am giving you a preamble number 52. For handover to PCI 100. So now the UE will send that preamble number 52, then it wants to contact the target handover cell. So in that case, we are using so-called random access channel during handover, but we got our own preamble. We are no longer fighting with other UEs in cell 100 because there are 52 preambles for those users. For the handover user who is going into that cell, that user gets a dedicated preamble because remember, handover means the call is already going on. Call has been on for some time. So if that fails, handover fails, we have call drop. And call drops are considered very bad. You are okay if you experience a little bit of delay in accessing the network, if it's a new call, few milliseconds would not hurt you. But if you are in the middle of conversation, your call drops, especially when you are talking to your spouse. Your call drops, you are in big trouble. So we want to make sure we do not drop the call. So for handover, we give priority. And the way we give priority in terms of random access channel is we dedicate some preamble for the purpose of handover. So those are called dedicated preambles. This gives you one more thing to optimize. Should we have 10 dedicated preambles, 20, 40, how many you should have? You need to consider uh, how many times you can expect handover, things like that. So the parameters you can optimize, the distribution between truly random and dedicated preamble, and other set of parameters I will just mention. So let's say uh, 
we want to do random access, so this is time. We send preamble, number 10, at some power level. Let's say we send something at uh, minus 10 dBm, that is the initial transmit power. Then we get no response from the E node B, so we think maybe our preamble got lost, so we increase the power by 2 dB. No response, again we increase the power by 2 dB. There is maximum number, let's say 1 to maybe 10. We will try 10 times, so maximum number of attempts. In this case is 10. The step size for the power in this case is 2 dB. So if you see a lot of access failures, then maybe you should uh, use instead of 2 dB, maybe use 3 dB. Give the UE an opportunity to succeed. Instead of 10 attempts, ask the UE to try 15 times, try a little more, try harder. Those are the examples of the parameters we can change to improve the random access success rate. Maybe you are not allowing UEs to use their total power. The UEs have 23 dBm, power class number 3. That is the UE that can send the transmit power of 23 dBm. So, if the UE is only transmitting up to, let's say, 15 dBm, you did not give UE an opportunity to use its full potential of 23 dBm. So, that is the idea. Give the UE an opportunity to fully utilize its power. So, increase the step size, increase the number of items, things like that. So, in summary, we want to improve the random access performance. And those are some of the parameters, step size, number of preamble transmissions, uh, how many dedicated preambles you want to have? So, so the SON algorithm would look at the existing situation that how many access failures you have, how many handover failures you have, because you ran out of dedicated preambles. So, in that case, uh, you need to increase the pool of dedicated preambles. So, that is the idea. So, again, if you do a good job designing this SON function, you will have pretty good uh, uh, handover performance in terms of delay. Uh, you, your call set time would be shorter because uh, UEs are able to contact the E node B very, very quickly. I see, I see. Intercell interference coordination. So let me give you a basic uh, idea there. Here is one of maybe the journal would be better. Uh, this is uh, available in release 8 from the standards perspective. So some vendors have this, some vendors would have this in the future roadmap. So here is the idea. We have E node B in charge of this UE number 1. So let's say we send data on resource block number 10. If we give the second UE, this is talking to another E node B, if this UE also sends the data on resource block 10, then what would happen? Then this would reach E node B1 because we have omnidirectional antenna, right? The Antenna doesn't know that oh, I need to send toward E node B2. Antenna sends signals everywhere throughout 360 degree omnidirectional antenna. So now we got significant interference because these UEs they're close by. So we got signal from our own UE. We got significant interference from another UE. Signal and interference they are of the same value in terms of dB, 0 dB, signal and interference, same power level. So very difficult to provide high throughput to this user. It will work. We have to do a lot of redundancy and so on. It will work, but throughput will be low. But LTE is all about excellent user experience. 
So we said, okay, let's do something so that we improve the alleged performance. So the idea here is the following. We tell this you, okay, use the resource block number 10, but then the other E node B will allocate uh, another resource block, let's say resource block number 30. So now, no interference on resource block number 10. So what are we doing here? We avoid using same resource block, physical resource block, near sellage. If you do that, you have increased signal to interference ratio because we are using different resource blocks at the sellage in different cells. Increase signal to interference ratio, meaning you will increase throughput automatically. That is the idea behind ICIC, intercell interference coordination. Now, two E node Bs will talk to each other via X2. That, okay, I'm using this resource block for my cell edge user. Uh, another node B says, I'm using another set of resource blocks for my cell edge user. So then they can coordinate and minimize the interference, maximize it. That is the idea behind ICIC feature. So again, uh, standard already supports that. X2 interface has uh, relevant messages, uh, which are X2 AP, X2 application protocol messages. Okay, I see, I see. Ah, finally, as I said, we want to save electricity bill. So we said, okay, let's uh, turn off the cell when we are not using it. Uh, two kinds of cells called booster cell, capacity booster. So let's say E node B has uh, four cells, alpha, beta, gamma, and on carrier frequency Fx, maybe another carrier frequency Fy. Alpha, cell alpha on another carrier frequency. Now this is booster cell. The reason we have these additional carrier frequencies is that uh, sometimes we have too many users, we run out of resources, so then we have added these new carrier frequencies. So now, if we have just few users, then we said, okay, uh, it is good enough to have only one carrier frequency and three sets. So in that case, we will turn off the cell here. Because it is a booster cell. We already have the coverage. The three cells, alpha, beta, gamma, they are already covering your three cells, covering full 360 degree coverage. So uh, those are good enough in terms of coverage. The additional carrier frequency cell is only for additional capacity. So here, we turn off the cell that is not required because it is a booster and then we save the electricity bill. Now, when we do that, we inform our neighbors that, oh, I am switching off my uh, cell alpha on carry frequency of Y. Okay, so please uh, make sure you do not do hand over to that uh, specific uh, cell in on that frequency. Now, it's possible that our neighbors, they have capacity issues, and they really need us to turn on this cell back so they can make a request. They told, by the way, you have this dormant cell whose the power is turned off. Can you please turn that on so that I can do load balancing uh, because I am heavily congested. So that is possible. So standard supports that. So this kind of uh, approach is possible for capacity booster. And also, do not forget home e-node bees. This is our own LTE base station. So if we are no longer at our home, there is nobody at home, we are all at work, children are at school, so we do not need to keep transferring from the home e-node B. So in that case, we will turn off the home e-node B. In the evening, when we are going back to our home, then the algorithm will figure out that, oh, we are reaching our home. We are a few miles away from the home, and then we will turn on 
a home in node B. So when we reach uh, the area closer to our home, we will be able to detect our home in node B cell and then we can do handover into that cell. In summary, energy savings, reduce the cost, reduce interference, two kinds of possible applications, capacity booster cell and home in node B. Okay, so that's uh, what uh, we have is the use cases for on a pretty good vision and uh, some features uh, we can use it uh, in an open loop fashion. Uh, we can add the recommendations and then m make sure that uh, the recommendations are making sense and then change the parameters. So that would be the most ideal way of uh, using SON. It will reduce your manual work and it should improve the capacity throughput, reduce interference, save energy, uh, etc. Okay, uh, and thank you very much for your questions. Mm, hope you learned uh, quite a bit. Uh, so at this point, uh, I would let uh, Diane uh, send evaluation forms uh, toward you. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. I'm still here for a few more minutes. Feel free to use uh, either the audio bridge, uh, star seven, unmute, or send questions through Q&A. I will send you the class notes as usual. Uh, any additional questions uh, you can ask through email. Okay. So again, uh, thank you very much and have a nice uh, rest of the day. Great. Thanks so much, Nisha. But, uh, I'm trying to put the survey up there right now. Um, hopefully it will come up this time. And uh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks again. Uh, I have completed eight out of the nine sessions. So um, again, thank you, and uh, thanks for staying on in case there's any additional questions. Uh, the survey is going up now, so if you could all stay on, uh, take the time to complete that. Uh, it is not wanting to come up. Let me try again. Okay, I can see the survey. Okay, great. Yep, just came up for me. So uh, if you could take the time to complete that. Um, again, some people do have uh, difficulty if closing your interface um, helps. You can uh, do that and then come back in. Uh, if it still doesn't work, if you'd like to IM me, uh, Diane Easter, I'll uh, go ahead and send you the direct link. So. Thanks again for your participation today. When you've completed the survey, uh, you're, fi you're free to uh, drop the live meeting bridge and interface. And uh, also, you do need to have it in full screen mode.
Nisha is still on the line. If there are any additional questions for him, you can use star seven to unmute your line or ask it in the Q&A interface in live meeting. I am waiting. Feel free to send questions or directly talk into the bridge. <laughs> <laughs>